that group that they did that with. Cool. So I'm about to talk about site building for developers. My name's Chandeep Kosa. And the full name of the talk is Site Building for Developers, What You Need to Know to Better Support Them. So who, I am, who am I? Um, I'm a freelance Drupal site builder for the past eight years. I live in London, in the UK. I'm a Drupal 8 core contributor, um, mainly focusing on front-end and usability issues. And I organized the Drupal West London user group, which I believe is the only regional uh, user group that exists in the whole of the Drupal world. I might be wrong. And I'm involved in training and mentoring Drupal developers, such as apprentices, on the Drupal apprenticeship scheme. So why is site building important? Well, it allows you to empower a wide audience of end users, including junior developers, site builders, and sometimes content editors. And some of those people aren't able to code, so you're effectively empowering them to be able to make changes. And as developers, it would decrease your workload. And that's because a lot of the users can make changes themselves without always having to call uh, developers and other site builders too. So my experiences. Um, so I've worked as a freelancer and contractor on uh, client projects. And uh, some of those have involved working on projects for uh, the Health Foundation, Toyota, Oxford University, Team GB, Christian Aid, and Tate Art Gallery. But my experiences with working with those larger clients and also smaller clients directly, um, such as uh, charities and startups, I found that a lot of the time, you've got some common issues. So what have I learned from them? Clients large and small benefit from having the flexibility to make changes as content editors. Clients have internal technical teams um, on occasions where you would like the client to be able to make as many of those smaller changes, and these would be made by site builders or junior developers. So it's important to be able to have a website that's um, using site building techniques so it's easier for those people to make further changes so developers can focus on more of those complicated uh, tasks where they add more value. But it's all about striking balance. So it's good to weigh up the pros and the cons of uh, site building techniques and development techniques, because in some cases, different situations, you benefit from using one or the other. And it may be, in some cases, faster to develop um, your solution in code, but you're reducing the uh, maintenance costs of running a website by having it done in site building, because you reduce uh, support tickets as well, and uh, you also empower your users to make changes themselves. Drupal is inside out. I don't mean this inside out. Um, although, if you have lots of exposure to Drupal, you can also have the little voices inside your head. At that point, I would uh, recommend stop doing Drupal, take a break, and perhaps go on holiday somewhere. What I am referring to is one of the things um, around inside out is the things on the inside or on the outside. Um, so if you're trying to do a task on a page, like add a block or something like that, you would first have to create it, then go to the page and add it. Um, some of you might be familiar with Dries Keynote and his blog around this. Um, so this is not very logical for many of your users. And what we're going to do instead is the opposite. So the opposite of inside out is outside in. And Dries, um, back in March, wrote this blog post on how to make Drupal outside in. Um, so he's basically talking about the authoring experience um, and how in Drupal 8, many things were, were good, but what we can do to improve 
the user experience in 8.2. Now, while we've been working here at Dev Days, many of those new things have started going into 8.2, which is great news. Um, so, one of the things that he includes is this video showing the current block adding procedure. So you'd first go to your section, find out what your block regions are, place your block in that particular region, click place block, It's not ideal because you're having to leave the page that you're editing. That's the video again. And here's the suggestion. You'd be able to just go on your page and click at place for block, and you'd be able to do it there contextually really easily. Now, there's good news. This now exists in Drupal 8.2, and we have it here. So this is a, a tweet from WebCheck on the 23rd of June. And it's basically saying the first implementation of the Drupal Agile Core feature development process, you can now place blocks in the front end. Um, so if you refer to this issue number, you'll be able to see more around that. And that's going to go into 8.2. So well done if any of you guys worked on it. There was also this. Uh, other issue I was working on during this weekend. And it's, it's a suggestion where you can basically improve UI, one of the many usability issues there are out there. One of the things we can do collectively as site builders and developers is just improving this process. And perhaps by having more open dialogue around users and watching people as they do things, we can improve this entire process. I was very happy to see this yesterday. Um, during the, the social, getting a credit for this. But um, one of those things can be increased communication. Now, I'm not saying we should get paper cups and put a string in them, but perhaps just meeting face to face and having more discussions around this would be good. Um, but not just, yeah, it's fine. In conferences and forums or dev days. And user research and testing could also be quite useful. Um, a lot of the times, people build things and then do testing afterwards once they realize there's an issue. Perhaps we could start architecting our solutions and do user testing around that. And uh, we could use the involvement from the Drupal UX team, perhaps, to help us with that. Um, two hours ago, upstairs in the sprint room, um, Ifric was working on um, trying to get an information architecture exercise to try and find where people wanted to put their menus and other items. Um, so other people can also contribute towards this. And this is happening upstairs live. Get involved. Any questions? So I don't have a, a set structure for that, but I feel that um, occasionally getting more people involved in the process is, is useful. And understanding the needs of your content editors and getting that run by um, other people um, that are more technical. As a site builder, I will try and put everything in site building line personally, um, even though I have the ability to write basic custom modules. But I just feel from a mainta maintainability perspective, um, it tends to work out quite well with the kind of clients I work with that this can then be handed over and you don't have some of those same issues. Um, 
Although, if you had a really high traffic site, it does start to make more sense to have less modules and perhaps have more optimizations in place. But if there was a magic calculator you put your requirements into and it tells you what to do, that would be awesome. Um, but I think that's experience. What we might be able to do is now that we've got Drupal 8, you know people have those eight balls, they shake them and they say yes or no? We could have a Drupal 8 ball. But I'm not sure if using that to use a site building method or a development method would necessarily be the best idea, but it'd definitely be more fun. Um, does anyone else have any experience around that question? Well, there, it's quite interesting to see how different agencies approach, approach this. So uh, a friend of mine used to work somewhere, and if they were to um, submit some code for code review, um, they would get rejected, and that wouldn't get merged in. If they hadn't said, I haven't used site building methods because, um, because the preference was there, and a lot of their end clients would be junior developers and site builders. So in that context, this is more important, but also, we don't always get all of the requirements, and sometimes we need to kind of make an inference of what might happen a couple of months down the line, and some of those guesses. But yeah, asking some of those questions that might prompt those answers, even if the client hasn't given it to you, I think can help really uh, cement that relationship that you kind of care, and you're more likely to get clients sharing information with you of generally what they're trying to do rather than giving you requirements. Um, so, Marion, you were mentioning that um, you, you attempt to use site building methods where possible as well, right? Right. <coughs> what are your experiences with that? Um, what we do is when we have a problem, we try to determine if there is a module we can use for that. Which most of the times is the case. When the case is not that, we need to decide if we want to build a general solution or we want to build a custom solution. Usually, it involves like a money decision, how much time will it take to build a general solution, how much money will it take to build a special solution, but also what we need to is how big is the chance that the general solution will be used by us again in the future. And sometimes, even though if the general solution is like three times more expensive, if we look back and we see we've had this type of project before, mm -hmm. and we did something custom, if we do this, general way, in the future, we will benefit from this, then we build a module that's general, it's not specific to that project, and we configure it for the project, and move on, and next time we have a solution. Great. Yeah. And in terms of the development cost for that, do you like break it down so it's weighed up between you and the client? The client usually doesn't care about that. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have like a triangle you go to? You know, there's that famous cost, quality, and time triangle. Is there something that you use to formalize this process a little bit more? Or do you just kind of, your experience tells you, right?
Does anyone else have any questions? Um, thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Ra raise your hand if you're a developer. Well, you could use panels and panelizer, perhaps. That might help. Um, in place editor on panels. Hmm. Alt and D, and you just jump. I'll show you it. So this is coffee. I'm holding Alt. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Did you want to finish? I'm holding Alt. And I tap D. And now I'm in coffee. So if I type in, I don't know, uh, views. I'm in views. That additional pop-up was just my last pass trying to fill in my form. I'm sure I can disable it. Or now that I'm on views, I want to go and do something with view modes. You know. Or yep, I'm going to go and have a look at the contextual links, or, oh, I'm going to go and wrap that in a feature. And you quite quickly can get around, but it also has additional settings. So if you typed in coffee, you've got additional settings here coming up, where you can uh, menus to include in coffee. So what you've got the option of adding is features, main menu, and navigation. But by default, they're all turned off. And I, I always use this. I always like to use this um, ad minimal admin menu. It's really cool because you can kind of hover over your shortcuts. Um, and you can just click on that and be on the home page. But you've got this additional information here. I just think it looks a little bit better. This is already a, a must for the Yeah. I think so.
that's quite interesting. Because I think a lot of people who do documentation are normally sometimes project managers or people who are a bit more client facing. Is anyone aware of dedicated site builders that also work with a, an additional skill such as documentation? Because I've heard that there are people who do project management and site building. Um, there's people who do IA, information architecture and site building. Because I don't think there's very many dedicated site builder roles around. I think it tends to be Amazie Labs who will hire them, a couple of places in the US, but I don't think it tends to happen as dedicated roles in, in Europe. It's quite interesting because I think that perception means um, people find that perhaps a site builder doesn't have command line skills, doesn't have code writing skills. Whereas myself as a site builder, I could do CSS and SAS, I can use Drush, and I can do a very basic hook for Malta. But yet, I feel that somehow we need to change the terminology, perhaps like site builder level one, level two, level three, or advanced or intermediate, just to kind of help distinguish. Or perhaps when you're slightly higher up on the skill set, you could perhaps call yourself a site architect. Not that that's exactly what it is, but something around those lines. Because you're a builder and you're an architect. And yeah. But perhaps as a freelancer, you kind of have to know all of those things or have an appreciation of them. Who's looking forward to going to the pub?